Uh, so hello everyone, uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation. Um, so yeah, this was part of my master thesis. Uh, this is a joint research with my advisor, Professor Ali Biham, uh, the Technion. Uh, and we're talking about uh, Bluetooth and specifically the Bluetooth pairing and uh, a variant of invalid curve attack or the fixed coordinate invalid curve attack, which is slightly different. All right, so uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Bluetooth. Uh, it's becoming one of the most popular protocol or specifically radio protocols in the world right now. Uh, all of you probably have at least one Bluetooth capable device in your pocket and more than one uh, in your bag. Uh, yeah, so today Bluetooth is becoming very, very popular. Uh, IoT devices, audio equipment, and uh, nowadays wearables and uh, computer peripherals all move to Bluetooth. Um, but what most of you probably don't know is that Bluetooth uh, today is actually two protocols. So there is Bluetooth uh, BREDR uh, and Bluetooth Low Energy. BREDR is the former version of Bluetooth, uh, the original uh, standardization. And Low Energy is more recent, but they coexist together, uh, used for slightly different uh, scenarios. Um, also, uh, both protocols promise to provide uh, confidentiality and many the middle protection in the link layer. So the application, in theory, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't provide their own uh, authentication. And uh, in this talk, we'll talk about this uh, promise and if it's provided as, uh, as it should be. All right, so uh, the Bluetooth pairing, uh, which is the connection establishment process, uh, is the process uh, where two devices authenticate each other and uh, exchange their uh, shared secret and the shared uh, uh, DFMA key. Uh, and the main, uh, the, the most recent uh, pairing protocols for uh, Bluetooth VR, EDR, and uh, Bluetooth Low Energy are Secure Simple Pairing, uh, or SSP, and LE Secure Connections uh, uh, for uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. And they are both very, very, very similar. Uh, they share a lot of uh, a lot of things, uh, and they're both variants of authenticated elliptic curve DFM protocol. Uh, so the first attack that made me at least uh, curious about uh, attacking Bluetooth, uh, there was many, many, many attacks before that, but the, one of the recent attacks uh, was uh, shown over uh, the first release of uh, Bluetooth Low Energy uh, by uh, Mike Ryan. Uh, and he showed that the original uh, pairing protocol uh, used in uh, Bluetooth Low Energy uh, was susceptible to uh, eavesdropping attack without any interaction from the attacker. The attacker could simply eavesdrop to the pairing, uh, iterate through uh, two to the 20 uh, 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 keys, temporary keys, and uh, that's that way breaking the session key and decrypting all of the uh, remaining traffic without interaction at all. So that's, that's like really bad. That does not provide any security whatsoever um, because two to the 20 operations today, it's less than a, sec a second in every computer. Um, and he also provided an open source software uh, which recovers uh, the session key of uh, Bluetooth sessions from uh, captured traffic. Right, but now uh, they addressed uh, uh, this problem and they moved to the new uh, LE Secure Connections protocol, uh, which relies on uh, elliptic curve cryptography. So uh, very, very short and uh, extremely shallow introduction uh, to elliptic curve cryptography. So what is an elliptic curve? An elliptic curve uh, is a group uh, which is defined by an equation and a field and an underlying field. So the equation we're looking at are uh, short Weierstrass forms, which are uh, defined with two parameters, A and B. Uh, so we have uh, Y squared equals X to the third plus AX plus B. Um, and all of the figures you, you're about to see are drawn over the uh, or real field, but uh, we, because in cryptography, we always use uh, finite fields. So the equations are over FQ. Right, so we're talking about groups. So we have a group elements. So the, the elements in elliptic curves are points or pairs of coordinates, uh, x and y, uh, which satisfy their curve equation uh, all over the underlying field. 
uh, we include another point, uh, which is very important uh, for this attack, uh, called the point at infinity, which will be uh, the identity element of the group. This is a new point that we introduce uh, to this uh, set of points, set of elements of the group. Uh, and because it's a group, you have an operation. Uh, in this case, the operation is addition, so uh, we'll, we'll denote it by the plus symbol, and we'll use uh, the inverse uh, notation of uh, minus one with brackets um, uh, for, uh, for a point P. And uh, we would also need a scalar multiplication, multiplication, which is simply adding a point to itself several times, right? So th this is the notations we're going to use. Uh, so point addition, uh, we'll divide the point addition into, uh, oh, sorry, I have the, the, the notation for scalar multiplication twice. Uh, anyway, uh, point addition, we'll divide it to point addition and point doubling. Uh, doubling will be uh, adding a point to itself and point addition is adding two different points. So how the inverse is defined? Uh, the inverse is defined very, very uh, simply. Uh, all you have to do in order to inverse a point is to negate the y-coordinate, uh, reflect it across the x-axis, and then get the inverse of that point, right? So uh, th this is how it works. Uh, and point addition, uh, adding two different points, is done by taking the line that crosses both points, P and Q, finding the third intersection with the curve, uh, and uh, reflecting that point across the x-axis, uh, getting the inverse of that point, and this will be the result of P plus Q. And you can see here the uh, simple, uh, one way to uh, compute this, uh, this formula. Uh, and as you can see, this formula do not involve the curve parameter B. So this, is, this means that uh, you can compute all of this uh, computation, find the result point, without even knowing what the parameter, what the B parameter of the curve. Now we'll move on to point doubling. So very similarly, but instead of taking uh, two points and finding the line that cross both points, we simply take the tangent line at point P, uh, and then again, find the second point of intersection, uh, re inverse that point, and get the resultant point. Note that this uh, formula also do not involve the B parameter of the curve. Finally, uh, I want you to notice a uh, last observation, which is that there are some special points uh, of some sort uh, that have an order of two. That means that if you add these points to themselves, you will always get uh, the identity element. The simplest way to see that is that if you have the y coordinate to equal zero, then uh, when you negate the y coordinate, when you get the inverse of this point, you will always get the same point and therefore adding them to themselves will give you the identity element. Great. So now I'll go briefly about the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Diffie-Hellman protocol, so I'll do this very, very fast. All you have to remember is that instead of doing uh, things in multiplicative um, modular group, we're doing these things on elliptic curve groups, and therefore we have to agree on an elliptic curve, which means the parameters A, B, and the underlying field uh, FQ, and we also have to agree on uh, generator point P, so both party uh, select the uh, secret key to be a scalar in this case. Uh, they multiply this scalar uh, with the generator point P. They get the public keys. They exchange these public keys. And then uh, they uh, multiply the secret key uh, by the correspondent public key to get the shared Diffie-Hellman key. Um, and since this process is commutative and associative, they will get the same uh, they will get the same shared key. Great. So now we can talk about the first major attack against protocols that uh, use uh, uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, uh, which is the invalid curve attack. Uh, so introduced by Biel et al, uh, <coughs> this cryptographic attack uses uh, points which do not satisfy the curve equation in order to extract, uh, in, the, in our case, the secret key uh, of the of a victim. So how it works, uh, so what we're doing here is uh, the attacker, we, we are in scenario again of uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, so we have a victim and you have an attacker, uh, and the uh, attacker selects a different group, a different elliptic curve, which differs from the original elliptic curve that was agreed upon by the B parameter, 
Uh, and what's special about this new curve is that it has uh, subgroups of small size. So he finds uh, this kind of elliptic curve. It's very, very easy to find. And when he finds one, he simply selects uh, a generator point of a small subgroup. Uh, we'll call this point P1. He then, uh, the victim transmits its public key. The attacker transmits a Q1. Sorry, Q1 will be the, the point uh, with the small subgroup. It transmits, its, uh, transmits Q1. Uh, and then the victim will try to compute the shared Diffie Hellman key by multiplying its secret key by the point Q1. Note that this, since this is a generator of a small subgroup, there are a very small uh, amount of possibilities for this shared Diffie Hellman key. Uh, we will have the, uh, <coughs> the assumption that, in, in, as, as, as happens in a lot of protocols, now the victim will send, transmit some message encrypted using the shared Diffie Hellman key uh, to the attacker. Uh, and again, for simplicity, let's assume that this message is known to the attacker. Uh, so the attacker can now uh, try to find the discrete log of uh, the secret key under this uh, small subgroup, right? So the, what the attacker is doing is simply iterating through all of the possibilities for this uh, uh, shared key under the small subgroup. Uh, and thus, finding, after finding the correct value, the correct shared key, it actually reveals the information of uh, what is the secret key modulo the uh, size of the small subgroup, in our case, P1, right? So by extracting this information, the attacker can now continue uh, this uh, uh, procedure using a different subgroup, a different uh, elliptic curve, or even the same elliptic curve and a different subgroup, and then extract another uh, information about another modulo of the secret key. And finally, after extracting enough uh, uh, information, enough uh, co-prime uh, modulus, the attacker can uh, reveal the secret key by applying the uh, Chinese reminder theorem. All right, so that, that's, that's the idea behind uh, the original invalid curve attack. Note that the original uh, invalid curve attack uh, uses two basic assumptions. Uh, one of them is that uh, we could initiate the uh, key exchange multiple times with the same private key. And the second one is that we could send uh, any pair of points, x and coordinates, x and y, uh, which will not satisfy the curve equation, right? So these, these are two assumptions that are used during the, the original attack. Uh, and this attack is known for a very long time, and therefore the Bluetooth specification suggested as a, a, a mitigation to this attack to simply refresh the Diffie-Hellman keeper every pairing attempt and thus preventing this attack because the first assumption will no longer uh, be uh, valid. Because if, if you uh, refresh the keeper every attempt, the secret key will, not, will be different on the, uh, on the next attempt. And as we saw later, all of the implementation we've tested uh, follow this, this suggestion, sorry. All right, uh, so the Bluetooth pairing uh, now, now we'll go a bit deeper into the uh, pairing procedure. So uh, it's responsible for generating the uh, uh, shared uh, encryption keys, as we previously say, uh, said. Um, and due to the, a lot, the, all of the similarities between SSP and LESC, uh, we will only talk about LESC, but everything I'm going to say regarding LESC uh, will all, also apply to SSP and vice versa. So uh, don't worry about that. So how, how the uh, Bluetooth port, uh, other pairing protocol is uh, comprised? Uh, so it comprised of uh, four phases. The first phase as feature exchange. It has no cryptographic uh, properties, so we're going to leave it in, in the side for now. Uh, phase two is the key exchange. Phase three is the authentication, and which is very important to us. We'll dig it into it very soon. And phase four is the key derivation phase. All right, so the key exchange is simply uh, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange, as we saw uh, just a sli few slides ago. Uh, and it uses uh, the standardized uh, P256 uh, elliptic curve, NIST elliptic curve, which is, I think, the most widely used curve today. Uh, <coughs> 
that, that's uh, in a LE secure connection. In the Bluetooth PR EDR, uh, it uses a uh, different curve, but also uh, NIST standardized. Uh, these two functions, uh, F4 and G2, you don't really have to remember them. I just put it here for, here for completeness of uh, this lecture. These are, two, these are two cryptographic functions that will be used during the authentication phase. All right, so now we can dig into the authentication phase. Uh, I hope you can see this diagram. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go uh, every step so, and then explain it, so if not, that's not horrible. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the authentication phase begin when both parties, device A and device B, selects a random nonce NA and AB. Both of them are 128 bits uh, long. Then uh, they both set some value that called uh, RA and RB. In this case, they set it to zero. Uh, doesn't really matter for us right now. Uh, then uh, device B commits to uh, both public keys and its knowns using function uh, F4 and transmits the commitment value, CB. Then device A uh, transmits its nonce, and device B reveals his nonce, following by a uh, check of the commitment. Uh, this process is merely to uh, make sure that no device have advantage regarding the selection of the nonce, because otherwise, attacker that tries to uh, device a man in the middle attack might use the ability to know the nonce to that the, the nonce is selected in one device before it was selected in the other, and might, might device some attack according to that. So that's supposed to prevent it, because uh, again, both uh, uh, both div uh, device a, B uh, commits to the nonce, and then device A reveals it, its nonce, and then device uh, B reveals its nonce. Right, but the most important part of the authentication phase is what comes next which is uh, the application of function G2 on both public keys and both nonces. This process should prevent any man-in-the-middle attack uh, to happen uh, in the Bluetooth pairing, uh, since I'm sure most of you at least uh, have encountered uh, the fact that when you pair two Bluetooth devices, you are presented with two numbers, and you have to confirm on both devices that these numbers are in fact equal. Or in some cases, you have uh, you, you are displayed one number and you have to enter this number into the other device. That also happens. That's another uh, different way to do it. Uh, but th this process is actually the authentication of Bluetooth. And what this number should mean is the sort of hash function on both public keys and both nonsense. Uh, and by confirming that both numbers are equal, you're supposed to prevent any man in the middle who wish to uh, change the, the, these public keys uh, and devise a, a simple, naive man in the middle attack. Because if, if you try to uh, change these public keys, then uh, you cannot uh, make sure that the nonces will be equal in both devices and the user will immediately notice it and say, hey, so someone attacking me. Right, so uh, that's, the, that's the basic idea of uh, the Bluetooth authentication. Now to the uh, confusing part. So uh, despite the fact that these diagrams show that the function G2 and F4 is applied to both public keys, PKA and PKB, it is actually applied only to the X coordinate of both public keys, right? So uh, <coughs> this is later in the specification uh, is uh, defined as PKAX and PKBX, but not in the diagrams. All the diagrams show only PKA and PKB, right? So very confusing, but that's the case uh, in Bluetooth. All right, so, uh, so now after we know that, after we know how the authentication works, we can think of uh, some attack. Uh, so the attack is sort of based on the fact that the Y coordinate is simply unauthenticated during all this authentication procedure. Uh, is, it, is not it is not involved in any of the computations. Uh, and with that, we can also remember that the uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, standard do not uh, require implementation to validate whether a given point satisfies the curve equation. Again, the mitigation that was used is not that. It's a different one. Uh, so. What we can do in order to attack this protocol uh, by changing the Y coordinate uh, to any value that we want uh, without affecting the authentication. 
So we'll describe two versions of our attack. Uh, the first one is the semi-passive, and the second one is the fully active. So the semi-passive is extremely simple. All you have to do is you are an attacker. Uh, you are we're in a man in the middle scenario. So both devices, device A and device B, want to pair with each other. So they both compute their uh, public keys. Device A transmits its public key to device B. All the attacker do is modify the Y coordinate to zero before transmitting it uh, forward to device B. We call the uh, new public key PKA prime. Similarly, device B tra uh, transmits uh, its public key and the attacker set the Y coordinate to zero and transmits PKB prime. Uh, what happens now? So now, uh, if you think about it, they might not get the same Diffie-Hellman key anymore. Or we have no uh, such uh, promise because uh, we're working in totally different elliptic curves, totally different uh, subgroups. This is not necessarily will provide the same value, and we call this value DHKA and DHKB. But to be more exact, we can say that with a rate of 25%, with a rate of quarter, we will always get uh, both points to equal, uh, both uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman keys to equal the point at infinity. Why is that? We just set two uh, public keys to be uh, generator of points, uh, generator points of subgroup of order two. So we multiply that by some random value, and with a chance of half, each of the random values will be even. If this value is even, we're adding a generator point of order two even number of times, and then therefore getting the identity element. So with a rate with a probability of quarter, both uh, secret keys are even, and therefore both of, both of the shared key will be the point at infinity. All right, so what happens if this event occurs? So if this event occurs, the attacker knows what the uh, shared Diffie-Hellman key was because everything worked fine. The shared key is, uh, is uh, uh, synchronized between the two devices. The authentication succeeded. Everything works perfectly. And therefore, the attacker knows uh, that the shared key was the point at infinity. It can derive, he can derive the long-term key and the MAC key and decrypt and encrypt messages however he likes without further intervention with the protocol, without anything else. So that's very simple, very straightforward. Now we need to uh, look at another two functions. Again, you don't really have to remember them. This is function f5 and f6. Uh, we need them in order to consider the key derivation. How could we improve this, uh, 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 probability, this success probability of a uh, quarter? We want to do something better. So how, how, could we, uh, how could we get a better success probability? So uh, in order to do that, uh, we first have to uh, introduce ourselves to the uh, key derivation phase. So the key, the key derivation phase begin where the where function f5 is applied on the shared Diffie-Hellman key, both nonces as, and both MAC values and MAC address. Uh, we then derive the long-term key and the MAC key using function f5. And then two uh, confirmation values are exchanged, ea and eb. Uh, these values are exchanged in order to make sure that both devices actually got the same Diffie-Hellman key, which which is uh, something important if you want to continue uh, encrypting and decrypting messages. So as you uh, remember from uh, the semi-passive attack, we currently uh, succeed, uh, the attack currently succeed only if the uh, two uh, shared Diffie-Hellman keys are the point at infinity. But uh, in this uh, fully active attack, we want to increase this uh, probability by also uh, by also using different uh, scenarios. So the scenario we'll be using is the scenario uh, specifically uh, when the Diffie-Hellman key, when DHKA equals uh, PKB prime, the attacker already knows that the attack is, the attack is going to fail in the, in the semi-passive uh, version. Because in the semi-passive version, if uh, DHKA equals PKB prime, 
there is no chance that T DHKB uh, will equal this, this value, and therefore the semi-passive attack will fail for, for sure. And, and the attacker can do nothing about it in the semi-passive scenario. So how could we use this information in order to improve our success, our success rate? So what we're going to do is simply test during the key derivation phase whether this event occurred. So the attacker could check the value of EA, the confirmation value, sent by device A, test it to be either uh, PKB prime or the point at infinity, the identity element. If it equals the point at infinity, it could continue as with the semi-passive attack, and it will have a chance of 50%. Uh, Otherwise, uh, it knows the semi-passive attack already will always fail, and therefore it should do something different. So what exactly it should do? So it should arbitrarily select some value, uh, DHKB prime, uh, to be one of the two possibilities for DHKB. It should then uh, uh, compute the correct confirmation value, EA, uh, to be EA prime by simply inserting the, the guess, the, the guess of the DHKB prime uh, to the function F5 and compute uh, the, all the confirmation uh, computation as usual. Um, F6, sorry. Um, what device P will then do, uh, he will try to verify that, uh, again, with probability of 50%. Uh, of half, he will, this uh, verification will pass. Otherwise, he will abort the, the pairing process. And if uh, the verification succeeded, the attacker knows what, what is the uh, Diffie-Hellman key uh, chosen by device B, because it's, it, he, he got the correct guess. So he knows that DHKB prime just equals DHKB. And then device B will compute and send his confirmation value EB. And uh, the attacker will compute and transmit uh, the correct confirmation value EB prime, which he already know because he knows the uh, DHK, uh, DHKA. Right, note that in this scenario, uh, now the attacker, the, the, uh, there are two different session keys, and therefore the attacker needs to decrypt and re-encrypt every message, every packet, every data packet that is being transmitted between device B and device A, which make it a lot harder to implement than the original semi-passive attack, but with the added benefit of a better success rate. So uh, this is like very, very simplifying uh, uh, slide to show you that the uh, success rate of the semi-passive attack uh, is only with a quarter of the, of the uh, possibilities and the fully active attack will have quarter of half depending on your uh, guess, but again, it doesn't really matter what, what your guess is, will be, it's, it's arbitrary. All right, so after we talked about all the details of the attack, we can move on and talk about uh, higher level details and implementation uh, and real life consideration. All right. So not unlike Wi-Fi and other uh, radio frequency-based uh, protocols, Bluetooth has a frequency hopping. Uh, there are, there are uh, radio-based protocols that use frequency hopping, but uh, some, some don't. Um, and when we are trying to implement these kind of attacks, we also have to consider this, even though most of the time these frequency hopping do not provide any cryptographic security. Uh, specifically in Bluetooth, I can tell you that uh, the frequency hopping in Bluetooth Low Energy is extremely simple and could be broken in seconds, if not less, uh, <coughs> as shown again by Mike Ryan uh, in 2013. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter because Bluetooth protocol is so simple that you can buy slightly more expensive equipment that will simply transmit and uh, listen to all of the Bluetooth channels uh, simultaneously, and then thus uh, eliminate this uh, problem uh, once and for all. Uh, we should also consider the uh, over-the-air packet manipulation, uh, because as you saw during the attack, uh, we, we had to capture packet and then uh, 
change it uh, before tra retransmitting it to the uh, uh, other party. So uh, there are some projects that try to do it today. As far as I know, but last time I checked was uh, about a year ago or even more, uh, there are no uh, commercially available equipment that could do it reliably for uh, Bluetooth 4.2 uh, with uh, at least secure connections or uh, <coughs> Bluetooth VR, EDR. Uh, but I'm sure that I don't think it's such a, a, a big problem that, that couldn't be resolved in the, the following years. Uh, again, the, it really depends on the incentive uh, for companies uh, or individuals to uh, design this equipment. Uh, if somebody wants, I will be happy to talk about how exactly this thing could be implemented and, and exactly what is the process that needs to be taken in order to, de to, devise, uh, to devise these kind of attacks. But it, it's possible. Uh, the, there has been a, a lot of work in different protocols that, that do similar things. Um, all right, so now we can move on to talk about the design flaws in the protocol that made this attack possible. So I think uh, one of the major design flaws, again, uh, I have been uh, approached several times uh, after, uh, after I gave this talk by several standardization uh, people who told me that, that as, as, as I already knew, there was uh, a lot of problems when standardizing uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptography uh, over the years, and especially when we go back to 2007 when uh, Secure Simple Pairing was uh, first designed. Uh, <clears throat> so I know uh, some of these uh, critics might be due to this uh, patenting things, but I think it should still be uh, in the slide for future uh, um, implementations and uh, uh, design of protocols. So using both coordinates during the key exchange is very unadvisable. Uh, it very, it, it, increased, it highly increased the attack surface uh, and it's really unnecessary today. You have multiple way to compress points such that you wouldn't have to send both coordinates. Uh, there are different uh, elliptic curves that you can work with that do not need the second Y coordinate. Uh, and you could also simply send the X coordinate and assign and then compute the Y coordinate from that. Uh, and secondly, and maybe the most, the more important one, is the fact that the protocol authenticates only the X coordinate. We couldn't find any uh, strong reasoning to, for doing this. I mean, if you already send both coordinates, you should authenticate both coordinates. I don't see why not. Uh, <clears throat> I should also point out that the original mitigation that was suggested during the standard of refreshing the, uh, the secret key every pairing attempt do not apply to this uh, attack at all. Uh, we don't rely on previous pairing attempts in order to extract information on the current pairing attempt, so th this mitigation is irrelevant. Sorry. Uh, so, and the obvious and recommended mitigation against this attack is obviously to to validate whether the given public key satisfied the curve equation. If you would do this validation, this attack will be prevented. All right, now, as with all the other uh, presentations, we will move on to the uh, disclosure part uh, and the test of uh, vulnerable devices. So we've tested a lot of vulnerable devices and uh, multiple vendors. Uh, first, we informed the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, which is responsible for the standardization of Bluetooth. Uh, the CVE was assigned uh, to this vulnerability. And then we started uh, hunting uh, implementations and checking whether they're vulnerable or not. So first, we, have to, we had to consider the fact that Bluetooth LE secure connections uh, and Bluetooth uh, secure simple pairing, the two pairing protocols, are implemented in two different uh, places. Uh, LE secure connections is implemented in the operating system, and therefore we had to look at the implementation uh, of multiple, oper multiple pop uh, popular operating systems. Uh, so the implementation we've tested was uh, the implementation of BlueDroid, 
which, of Android, which is called Dodroid. Um, we actually haven't tested, but uh, was, were informed by Apple that uh, both iOS and uh, the Bluetooth implementation was vulnerable. Uh, iOS and macOS implementations were both vulnerable. Uh, Microsoft actually at the time uh, didn't have an implementation of any secure connections. Instead, it had uh, only the implementation of the legacy uh, ping, uh, which, as you might remember, is vulnerable to the passive, very, very simple attack. So that's not like a good thing. Um, Next, uh, we moved on to implementation of secure simple pairing. Uh, so secure simple pairing, opposed to the uh, uh, any secure connection, is actually implemented by the Bluetooth chip. So we've tested all of the three major uh, vendors of Bluetooth chips, which is uh, Qualcomm, Broadcom, and Intel, and found all of them to be vulnerable. Um, so that was, I don't know if surprising or not, because by now we already knew that probably all of the implementation will, will be vulnerable. Uh, and the industry reaction was actually pretty good. Uh, it, it required a lot of effort in order to coordinate between all these uh, vendors, but after we uh, overcome this uh, obstacle, all of the vendors uh, acted very responsibly. Uh, they all uh, provided patch uh, to their uh, devices. Some of them released their patches through their vendor partners, like Qualcomm and Broadcom. Others uh, simply released the patch online uh, and or through their update uh, procedures. Um, so yeah, all, all of the operating system have been updated. But the more important thing is that the Bluetooth uh, actually uh, addressed this uh, finding uh, very seriously uh, and released a formal statement saying that Yes, this problem occurs, uh, and yes, we are aware of it, aware of it, and we'll also, at least as they uh, promised here, uh, we'll add the uh, vulnerability testing to their qualification program, so that no Bluetooth uh, co uh, compatible device could be released to the market with this vulnerability in the future, which is very encouraging, uh, and and that's. Thus, the, the specification was, was changed, and, uh, and hopefully this vulnerability will not occur in the future. Uh, finally, uh, I want to sum up by saying that uh, we have introduced uh, a fixed coordinate invalid curve attack, which uses uh, the fixed X coordinate in order, in order to device invalid curve attack uh, in a different way, uh, which is might be useful in some other protocols. Uh, I currently haven't encountered uh, another protocol that have this special design uh, issue, but maybe. Um, <coughs> we presented this application on the Bluetooth pairing protocol. Uh, we've proven that all of the current pairing protocols are insecure. None of them uh, was, were, uh, was secure against this attack and previous attacks together. And uh, <coughs> we de we've discovered multiple design flaws in the Bluetooth protocol, which again were addressed uh, when in protocol specification change. And we found that all of the vendors, all of the big vendors are vulnerable, uh, and, mod <coughs> and according to this finding, the protocol was modified and uh, our findings were addressed to all of the channels. Finally, I want to thank uh, the Third Coordination Center for helping us to coordinate within all the vendors. Uh, again, it was very difficult. There were a lot of vendors. Um, and for all of the vendors for patching the system and not having to go through a trouble of uh, ping pong between us uh, a lot about this. Uh, that's it. Thank you for the great talk, Lior. If you have any question, please uh, come to the micro and ask. Thank you. Uh, hey, good work, by the way. Not a criticism of the work, but do you have any uh, understanding for how this happened in the Bluetooth process? The checking for the point in infinity, checking for the uh, point on the curve, those tests were in X9 a gazillion years ago, what, 20 years ago? 
Do we have any uh, insight into how the Bluetooth people didn't even refer to the ANSI standards that probably existed at the time? So that's totally not an inside information. I, I really don't know what went through the yeah. process, but what I've heard from people that came to me after these talks that was that the patenting uh, regarding uh, point validation is very, 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 uh, what made things very complicated uh, in, in, the in the time. Uh, there is actually a patent against, uh, that, that covers point validation, which is a very broad <laughs> thing to cover, uh, which uh, again, if companies were trying to validate their point by simply uh, testing the curve equation, that might result in a patent violation. Uh, so that, that, that made things very complicated. Thanks. No problem. So I just had a completely weird question. Um, when you're talking about the, tech, the existing technology that does over the air um, packet manipulation, is that doing it as it's being broadcast or is it doing some sort of man in the middle thing? So I'm actually not like, I haven't tested it fully okay. to understand exactly what it's doing. Uh, and again, it doesn't work with uh, the uh, DFM uh, side. So maybe it relies on the fact that you can simply break the, the encryption key and thus uh, uh, simply, uh, yeah, jam the one device and transmit another packet uh, yeah, altogether. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to okay. confuse you. All right, that's fine. Thanks. Okay, any other question? If this is not the case, then uh, please thank the speaker once again.